It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. Perhaps if Martin had gone to church more often, this wouldn't have happened. He'd still have died, of course. But don't we all, eventually? What Martin didn't get, however, was the privilege of going into the fabled shining light. He didn't even know he'd died at first. He'd just been sitting in his recliner, watching quality television over his bulging porch, when he felt a pain in his chest. Everything went black for a moment, then everything went back to normal, or so he thought. He could still see the TV screen and hear the goings-on of his show. He just felt a little numb. It wasn't until he tried to reach for his bottle of beer that he realized he couldn't move. He didn't register at first, but after about 30 seconds of forced immobility, he started to panic. He wanted to scream on the off chance that his bitter nag of a wife or his failure of a son would run in to help him, but his tongue and fat lips wouldn't move. Besides, neither of them were home. What felt like hours rolled by, and Martin's panic skyrocketed. How long would it be until he got help? Would he get help? Would he even be found? His wife was still out on one of her marathon shopping sprees, and Mike... The all-round disappointment of a son who just wouldn't leave the family home, despite all the subtle and not-so-subtle hints dropped that he needed to get a job. He was probably outspending what would have been his college fund if he hadn't dropped out of high school in his new favorite drug addiction. What if he was stuck like this forever? Despair filled Martin's plaque-clogged heart. He wasn't getting any better. If anything... He finally clued in that something was deeply wrong when he saw his chest wasn't moving. Well, crap. This wasn't how he thought death would be. Where were the fluffy clouds and the sickeningly happy harp-plucking angels? Or, more realistically, the firing and suffering of eternal damnation. Somewhat worried, Martin deeply pondered this for a while occasionally breaking from his train of thought to ogle the bouncy blonde on the grainy TV screen. His distress, or more accurately, apathy, eventually soured into impatience as the hours rolled by. His show had long since ended and had been replaced by a slew of infomercials and products that would give you your hair back in 30 days or less, or trim that belly fat down to nothing in five months while saving you money. Call now and receive. Martin heard the front door open. <gasps> he felt hope. Maybe, if his wife found him, she'd scream and cry and prove that, after everything that had happened between them, she still loved him. <sighs> oh, blast. It was just Mike. Martin doubted many men could get disappointed by their sons after they'd gone and kicked the bucket. Mike finally found Martin limply spread over his dirty easy chair, cold and blue, and bearing an uncanny resemblance to a beached whale. Possibly high, he screamed like a little girl. In no time at all, the police, the doctors, and Martin's wife crowded the dingy house. Martin listened as Mike blubbered incoherently, and Joni tearfully, yet somehow bluntly, told everyone there had just been a matter of time before our tubby hubby's heart would give out. Martin was actually happy. He'd been able to make her cry, after all. Not that that was a good thing. What he meant was, he would have scowled if he could have, as someone turned off the TV. Hey, infomercials were better than nothing. He heard grunting and struggling beneath him and realized some EMTs, or whatever they were called, were trying to lift him onto a gun. That was just insulting. He couldn't have been that heavy, could he? As they pulled the white sheet over Martin's head and hauled him away, Martin chided himself over being self-conscious over his weight, <laughs> despite being dead. Martin had always hated hospitals, but morgues were even worse. He lay on a slab of what he assumed was cold metal, 
completely naked. He tried to think positively as his skin turned ever paler. He then saw the coroner, and more importantly, the coroner's knife and other tools. He was positive he was going to get cut open. The man hummed to himself as he ran a blade down Martin's chest, whose cold, flabby skin sagged a little as it was parted, revealing pinkish innards that Martin didn't know or want to know he had. Oh, Martin wanted to cry. He screamed inwardly as the man began scooping and pulling out organs that glistened wetly in the pale, fluorescent light. He felt horrible pain just looking at them, even though he felt nothing physically. He pleaded for them to be returned, as his long coil of intestines were snaked out of his body. He knew it was futile when the coroner wrapped his hand around his cold, dead heart and pulled. Holding it in his hands and looking down on it, the coroner shook his head and tut 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 it before returning to his grisly task humming all the while. Martin tried to focus on that bouncy TV blonde during all the sucking, slurping and slicing. It didn't quite work like he'd wanted to do, for some reason. After his organs were opened, prodded and examined, they were patched back together and returned to Martin's chest cavity, more or less in the right order. Once Martin had been thoroughly violated and stitched back together like a fleshy scarecrow, he was taken from the table and shoved into a dark morgue shell. Martin just wanted to be buried and be done with it. Why did his wife have to drag things out like this? Relatives he didn't even know had shown up, crowding around his open casket and bawling. Neither of his two daughters were there, one because of out-of-the-country college work, the other presumably out of spite, even though she was on vacation. Martin inwardly cringed as one person he didn't recognize got tears and spittle onto his black suit, the last one he would ever wear, one he'd wear for the rest of his death. Though he couldn't move his head, he could see the crowd part a little. He saw his wife, her weathered face slick and red with tears under her black veil, approach his casket. He felt a little bit happier and remembered their time together. Their honeymoon had ended too soon. He then saddened as he went over the flaming wreck their marriage had become. He'd taken to drinking not long after his youngest, Becky, was born, and Joni started spending money she knew they didn't have. Their arguments were vicious and often lasted for hours, shouting matches that ended only when their throats were too hoarse to scream. By the time Becky went to college and Mike moved back in, they had stopped talking almost entirely, sharing the same house but leading separate lives. Why didn't she just leave him? He never knew. He regretted everything, fighting with his wife in front of their kids, letting himself go, Hush, all the bottles he'd downed. When he finished reminiscing, he realized Journey was looking him right in the eye. He wanted to cry, to say sorry for everything, but fell silent when she started whispering. Ah, oh, if only those doctors had known what they should have been looking for, Marty. The lid of the casket closed before he understood. We'll be back in a few hours, said the girl's parents as they closed the door. She hadn't moved from the cold, hard wood floor. She could do anything. Well, what does she want to do? She gazed outside to see the autumn leaves in the sky of a dark shade of blue. Hmm, a horror movie would be nice, she thought. She dropped herself upon the couch and turned on the TV to see the face of a person dead and of rock. It made her jump, but she laughed at the face, for it had been a cheesy movie. By now it was dark, and she placed her hand down by her side to pet her doll. Well, at least she wasn't lonely. 
The dog licked her softly, brushing its sandpaper-like tongue across the palm of her hand. She got bored of the movie, so she flipped to the next channel to see what was there. Another called Stakeland. She watched the film for about 30 minutes until she got bored again. She placed her hand down to her dog, and once again, it licked her hand. She wanted to feel adored. Flipping towards the lower channel, she passed upon the news and was chilled by the report. Madman escapes from psychiatric hospital. Stay indoors. And then the power went out and the news was cut short. She got scared, so she ventured around the house locking all doors and windows, closing the previously left open windows in her basement and the one in her bathroom. For all that she had been scared, like a cat out of its skin in the old cartoons when it would see a ghost, she was also stricken by the sense of impending doom. From running around the house like a madman herself, she had gotten exhausted. She was not one for sports or the such. She went to the faucet in the kitchen and grabbed a glass, filling it with cold water, almost over the top, but not too much. She turned off all the lights going up to her room. The house was pitch black, and she carelessly stumbled into her room blindly. She fell onto her bed and called for her dog, and it came shuffling into her room, bumping into things in the dark as well, and it again licked her hand kindly. The girl laid on her bed, slowly drifting into sleep, her body and head feeling weightless, and began to spin, until she heard a drip, drip, drip. She knew if she left the water on her, parents would be mad, so she carefully moved in the dark so she wouldn't trip. She walked down the hallway, almost to the stairs passing up the bathroom. Almost to the stairs passing to the bathroom. When she heard a drip, and she was confused as to why the water had been running in there. She turned around and walked to the bathroom, flipping on the light swiftly and with care. When she flipped the switch on, she was bewildered to see that the faucet was indeed not leaking so she suspected it was a shower faucet. She pulled the curtain away, and what laid in the tub nearly made her vomit. The bloody mess that awaited her was her very own hound, and what was written in its blood made her nearly drop to the ground. And what was written on the bathroom's wall of Milchew? Humans can lick too. awoke to the shrill wail of a siren. At first I was filled with confusion, which solidified into disbelief, which blazed into flat-out panic. I shook Susie awake, screaming that we needed to grab the kids and get out of here. She stared at me for a moment. Then she too heard the siren. The ground shook beneath us and orange light flooded the windows. She tried to argue that we needed to stay here and hunker down, but I knew duck and cover would not save us. I barked out that I'd start the car and she should get Chrissy and Wes. We both flew out of bed. I scrambled on bare feet out of our room and down the stairs, while Susie rushed to get the kids. As I tore through the unlit garage and onto the rough driveway, the soles of my feet getting covered with black dust, I landed on a nail or something else sharp, but I didn't feel any pain. The car door was locked, and I didn't have the keys. Of all the times for me to lock them in the car, I cursed and slammed a fist into the window. Then I ran back into the garage and over to my tool chest. <sighs> Where? I hissed, throwing screws and nails out by the fistful, until my hands finally wrapped around a good, solid hammer. I sprinted back over to the car and smashed the window, sending shards of glass everywhere. The car alarm screamed bloody murder along with the sirens. Susie! I shouted as I thrust my arm inside the cabin and fumbled with the keys. I did not have time for this. I looked up and saw my wife in the doorway, still in her nightgown, with 
with Chrissy bawling in her arms and Wes fearfully clinging to her leg, a wet spot growing in the crotch of his Captain America pajama pants. I felt the keys click and the engine roared to life. Come on! I screamed at them as I flung the door open and threw myself inside. Susie looked at me, pleading, then practically shoved Wes into the back and eased her way into the passenger seat next to me. I didn't give her time to close the door behind me before I floored the gas pedal, its grooves burying themselves into my foot, and the car sped in reverse, the squeal of its tires adding to the hectic cacophony. Daddy, what's going on? Wes wailed as we sped out of the neighborhood. Susie said something, but I couldn't understand her. And I couldn't take my eyes off the... The night sky lit up around us, bathing everything in blinding orange light. My eyes temporarily blinded, I nearly veered off the road as my family screamed. The ground under us shook as a deafening boom roared. When I was able to see properly again, I almost started crying when I saw the fiery mushroom-shaped cloud in my rear-view mirror. We drove for what felt like an eternity. I didn't know where we were going, where we could go. Half deaf, I shouted for Susie to turn on the radio to maximum volume. I could just barely make out something about Soviets in a state of national emergency. We weren't ready. Whistles off in the distance drowned out the rest for me. I saw more clouds swell in the distance. Then my eyes happened upon the fuel gauge, whose needle ticked to the farthest left possible. Our sedan slowed down, then finally stopped. What was I thinking? I should have listened to Susie. You can't outrun a bomb. I looked first at Susie and Chrissy, then at Wes. I'm so sorry. I love you. Just behind me, I heard one last whistle, growing louder by the second. I lowered my head and started to cry. Cancer is a bitch. She is cold and swift, but relieving. I have stage four lung cancer. Every day I find myself coughing up blood into a paper towel or into my hand. I'm growing weaker with every turn of day and night. <laughs> I guess karma finally caught up to me. As a young man, I did very terrible things. When I was in the war... I killed a few people. The adrenaline I felt when I'd first killed was something almost alien to anything else. Something foreign. Something inside of me changed. Something primal. When I was discharged, I found myself craving another fix of what I'd done while I was in the service. Every now and then I would find some homeless man or a hooker on the road. And I would seize my opportunity. I usually strangled them and then disposed of the body in the pine forest behind my home. That became the light of my life. It was what got me up in the morning, and what allowed me to sleep. It was all I did. Dragging a body in a white sheet back to the woods was my normal routine from then on. After my service, I was employed at a hardware shop. Working there helped me pay my bills that stacked in the kitchen of my little house on an old rural road. While I was there, I met a young woman who clearly showed interest in me. We began talking, and every now and then I took her out. I learned a lot about her. It turns out her last lover was an abusive drunk. When she told me, a fire began to burn in my chest, and a tickle erupted in my gut. Just hearing this made me excited and angry. I found out where he lived and made work of him. I buried him in the forest behind my home. 
I felt my passion for what I do begin to dwindle, as another passion was presented in my life. Love. We'd been dating for six months, but I still kept up my normal hobby. She never found out. Later, Tracy, my new lover, and I got married and had three kids. They grew up fine with nice paying jobs, and by this time, I'd definitely given up my hobby. <laughs> that lifestyle wasn't suitable for a father, and soon a grandfather. A few years after my grandchildren were born, I was diagnosed with lung cancer. My life started going downhill. When my grandchildren were in their teenage years, Tracy passed away from a heart attack. The little bastards I call grandchildren were more concerned about who got Tracy's possessions and the money she left over than the fact that their grandmother had just died. I felt angry, but descended into a deep state of depression. I became very senile after Tracy's death. I didn't want to see anyone, and I didn't want to put up with their shit. A few months later, my birthday came around. All up until then, my home, my sanctuary of peace and quiet, was bombarded with family and the grandchildren. They were brandishing their new phone devices and flashy clothing. They never let their gaze off. Towards the end of the party, they told me they were going to walk into the woods and explore for a bit. I scowled at them and told them they weren't allowed to go up. To be honest, I didn't care where those bastards went. I just wanted them out, and I didn't want them in the pines. I worried that one of them would come across an exposed skeleton. I wasn't taking a chance. I told them to go down an open trail that went away from the pines. They were displeased, but they listened. As they exited the house, I gazed out of the window. They looked back, but didn't see anyone. So, they quickly ran into the pines and disappeared. I cursed to myself quietly. In total, I believe I brought around thirty or so bodies up there. I slipped out of the house quietly and headed to the tool shed. I grabbed a shovel and began walking to the pines. Looks like I'm going to have to add a few more to my count. Oh, I take in a sharp gasp in disbelief and then bite down on my tongue to keep me from screaming. I really did it. I look down at my quivering hands. They're covered in blood. Drops of red red blood slide through my fingers and fall on my shoes and the floor. The blood's not any special shade of red. Not crimson and not scarlet. Just red. My arms fall limply to my sides. I killed him. It was in self-defense. I didn't want a physical relationship with him. I didn't want any kind of relationship at all. He'd barged into my home and gotten violent with me, like he always did when we argued. He'd hit me. I'd barely avoided another blow then. He'd charged at me. I'd run. I had no idea what he was going to do to me. I'd made it as far as the kitchen before he'd cornered me and caught my arm in his tight grip. Yeah. He was hurting me and screaming that he'd do far worse. I wasn't even thinking. I saw the rolling pin on the counter and I just grabbed it and swung. I heard a crack and the next thing I knew, he'd let go of my arm and was lying on the floor. As my adrenaline fades, I raise my dripping hand to the cheek into which this monstrous fist had slammed. It was just now starting to ache. It would no doubt be turning purple like the rest of my collection of bruises some of which I could hide with my clothes, some of which I couldn't. Wait, is he really dead? I slowly inch towards him, 
and look at his crumpled form. A collapsed heap of what had been a muscle-bound churl of a man. His dark eyes are glassy and wide open with shock. And the side of his head that I hit looks like it's collapsing in on itself. It was in self-defense. He was going to hurt me again. Oh, oh it was in self-defense, officer. I say aloud. I grin wickedly. Why would anyone believe otherwise? Oh, will my poor, trembling fingers possibly be able to punch in 911? The fallen leaves dance and chase each other through the shadows of tombstones. The rustle reminds me of children's laughter. Perhaps it is laughter, he mused. They were free of the tree that had held them enslaved. Free now to fly on the winds that teased them all summer. I caught a movement that was neither leaf nor shadow, that walked into a moonlight clearing. Such a fragile figure, slender and graceful, a willow among sturdy oaks squat apples and lumbering pines that comprised most of humanity. I know, even though the creature was too far away, that the hair bound so tight beneath the jacket's hood is the color of old gold. The eyes are silver gray, the skin a pale, smooth ivory. The creature that moves so silently through the dancing leaves and shifting shadows is a treasure I crave with an intensity that sometimes makes me angry. This creature is mine. But a treasure I take more pleasure in watching than taking for the moment. How many nights have I stood watch over this night traveller as it wound its way through the cemetery? How many nights have I watched the weary creature stop and rest? The scent of grease and burnt food on the clothing is a sickening counterpoint to the rose and sandalwood of the smooth skin. How many times have I stood unseen, so close I can hear the soft breath and fluttering hearts? How many times have I let this sweet delight rise and walk away? One night, I won't let it walk away. He frowned as the creature stumbled. <laughs> Exhaustion, he surmised. It happens sometimes. Barely halfway across, the weary creature stopped and sat down at a cold stone bed. A change from its normal behavior. Always before, it had stopped beneath the singing tree, an ancient oak filled with wind chimes by mourners. I frowned and moved silently through the shadows, till I stood mere feet behind the slumped form. I listened to the heart that beat far too fast and hard, the breath that was a ragged draw. Oh, illness. Why did it strike these frail creatures so quickly? Still, my sweet diversion is young. Illness will be thrown off soon. And soon it will be old enough to claim forever. The moon grew full and waned following its own time. The dark nights came and went, but no footsteps broke the silence of the stone garden, save mine. I had gone from sorrow, to anger, to fear. Why had I never followed the golden creature to its home, so I would know where to start looking for it? Even the leaves had fled, leaving the ground bare until the snow had taken pity and tucked it into a feathery quilt of pristine white. It was on an icy cold night that the moon broke from the clouds and sparkled against the snow. There it showed the slow, progress of a too thin figure. I leapt from my perch with a strangely eager heart, but then saw the slow, staggering movements. It could not be my lost creature. The body was rail thin, the hair lank, and yet sandalwood and roses teased me beneath the sour sweat of fever. I had to know for sure. I followed carelessly, he could afford to, 
The shambling creature was focused upon its path and nothing else. Sheer strength of will kept the feet plodding their slow path until they came to the singing tree. The faint wind sent the chimes hidden high above in the tree branches, dancing into a slow and mournful melody. The head looked up, and the hood fell away. Oh, my heart nearly broke. What had happened to my sweet face treasure? When had it grown so pale and feeble? The golden hair was dulled, the eyes sunken, the ivory skin flushed the grace torn away by a body struggling to survive. My little wandering prize, my small amusement, my delight, was soon to be a hollow shell. <sighs> Such was always the case with these creatures. The graveyard was proof of that. But this creature was mine. I would not allow it to die. She curled up at the base of the tree. She never knew she was being watched. This was her final night. Some primal instinct had told her, and so she had struggled to come to the Garden of Silence. She had never feared this place. Always it had welcomed her into its calm embrace. She sighed, closing her eyes, listening to the soft chimes. So very tired. She didn't feel the arms that so gently embraced her, nor the piercing fangs at her throat. There was no fight for the life that was falling too swiftly to catch. Instead, she stepped out of the cocoon of flesh and spread her wings. Freedom and light, welcoming another angel home as a creature of darkness wept crimson tears, berating himself for not capturing his treasure when there had been time. Ah yes, here it is. My descent into madness reaches an ear-splitting crescendo. My last whisper of sanity reeks of whiskey and stale breath. I take a final swig of sullen comfort before violently smashing the empty bottle on the grimy, tiled floor. The voice calls to me, taunting me. James, didn't your doctor tell you to breathe deeply and relax? A string of curses escapes my mouth. Its mocking laughter echoes throughout my head, forcing my face into a contemptuous scowl. Eventually, I concede to the voice and laugh along with it manically. Shards of plastic ricochet about the room as I hurl a bottle of antipsychotic medication at the wall. I suppose alcoholism preceded my psychosis. At the very least, it was around the period of heavy drinking, subsequent to my wife's unceremonious departure, that the voice began haunting me. The welfare and disability checks continued flowing in. However, all available funds were inevitably squandered on cheap liquor and cigarettes. My mind spiralled into a state of self-pity, self-loathing and self-destruction. I started to lose control in the most peculiar manner. Let's just say that getting blackout drunk daily had quite disturbing effects. I would wake up in strange circumstances, such as naked in my musty cellar, using a dirty floor mat as a blanket. Another morning, I woke up to an unpleasant draught and found that every window and door in the house was left wide open. In these instances, I had absolutely zero recollection of my intoxicated shenanigans, nor did I give a shit. I simply reached for the bottle and scorned my pathetic existence. So, given my bizarre sleeping habits, it didn't surprise me when I awoke in my bathtub beneath a pile of soiled clothing. However, my heart exploded in fear when I heard deep chuckling echo throughout the room. I shouted loudly, Who the fuck is there? I scanned the room frantically, but couldn't seem to locate the source of the sound. 
a voice cooed warmly. Why, it's just me, dear chap. The voice in your head. Fuck you. I'm phoning the police, you sicko. I screamed, darting out of the room. Well, fuck. The police were unable to find anything, despite scouring the house thoroughly. I recalled the voice seeming to come from the heavens, and pointed the officers to the ceiling vents. A sweep of the cops' mag lights revealed a dust-ridden, decrepit interior, with no apparent signs of activity. <laughs> Ain't nobody living in those dust vents, you washed-up drunk. See a shrink instead of wasting our time. I laughed at myself after the cops left surmising that my perpetual intoxication had led to the decay of my mental faculties. This provided me with some comfort, until that dark chuckle boomed over my laugh, making me go silent. I know what you're thinking, James. Maybe that police officer was right about you being insane. Don't visit a psychiatrist, however, for if you can't hear me, won't we both be so alone? I tried to ignore the voice, but it kept pestering me, making it clear that it wouldn't accept my silence. The voice was clearly female, yet it had a sick, distorted timbre that unsettled me to the core. What do you want? I croaked hoarsely. Rich, bellowing laughter flooded the room, somehow pouring into my ears from all directions and engulfing me. Ah, yes. There we go, sweet James. I knew you'd come around. She cooed. I just want to listen to your problems. I can make everything all right again. I can make you happy. I just want to help. Disturbingly, I found myself quite enjoying my conversations with the voice. Even if I was likely insane, she was beyond mentally unstable. Hearing about her sick fetishes for gore and disembowelment, I couldn't help but chuckle manically. Needless to say, I booked an appointment with a psychiatrist as soon as possible. I was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. How completely and disgustingly predictable. I recall the doctor looking at me sternly and asking me solemnly, does the voice in your head ask you to hurt anyone? I pondered for a moment, reflecting on the voice's disturbing comments. Well, despite expressing a clear preference for gore, she never specifically asked me to commit such an act, yet. Uh, no, not at all, sir, I replied. Multiple doctor visits, several courses of antipsychotic medication, and months of intensive counselling sessions later, and I was still bat shit crazy. It was around then that she started questioning my lifestyle. James, 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 you're wasting away. Why fight your insanity? Embrace it, she purred. And stop drinking alcohol, dearie. It's such a pathetic crutch. I sat on my worn-out couch, dumbfounded by her sheer nerve. Gathering my thoughts, I slowly replied, Well, that's an interesting proposition. But am I truly insane? Your voice seems quite real to me. Out of nowhere, she snarled. Don't kid yourself, you crazy alcoholic bitch. You're wasting your fleeting time on this earth. And for what purpose? While you wallow in self-pity, a father weeps over the warm corpse of his dead daughter. A cancer patient inhales her dying breaths. Emaciated village children fight over meager rations. And youths indoctrinated by false prophets march to their deaths. Meanwhile you, with the opportunity to have great twisted fun, just sit here and rock. I silently stared at the floor as her words resonated with me. By God, she was right. What great fun 
could I have? I stuttered. Shut the fuck up, you sack of crap. I'm sick of your shit. I'll come back when you have your shit together. She bellowed. Wiping gin off my lips, I smirked. In what circumstances does an imaginary voice disappear from a mind of a lunatic? She won't go anywhere. She can't. I need her, I thought, as the gin put me to sleep and the world faded to black. When I awoke to a throbbing headache, I didn't receive the usual sarcastic greeting. I called for her, helplessly. Are you there? I'm sorry. I will stop drinking, I promise. I cried desperately, but my hollow promise fell on stale air. I groggily recalled making that very same promise so, so many times to my sweet ex-wife. I violently face-palmed, realizing that it was futile to try coaxing a voice in my own head with lies. I collapsed on my bed and shivered. I was alone. Pathetically, I cried into my dirty pillow and drifted back into a restless sleep. Strangely, I woke up with a clear mind and a newfound sense of resilience and determination. I set about tidying my house with a silly grin plastered on my face. Over the next few days, I cleared the house of trash and debris, pouring my stash of alcohol down the sink. I no longer had a thirst for liquor. I no longer needed a crutch for my shattered psyche. My government checks were no longer squandered. I bought healthy, nutritious food and saved any remaining funds. For months, I honed my body with a rigorous exercise routine, strengthening my muscles and enhancing my cardio. Needless to say, I was diligent in avoiding any government detection of these activities, lest my disability funds be rescinded. I felt better than I ever had in my entire life, and yet something was missing. Her voice. I yearned for it, that smoky and darkly sensual tone that used to resonate throughout my disturbed mind, coaxing me further into depravity. She had abandoned me due to my alcoholism and lack of productivity, yet after such a long period of sobriety, her voice had not returned. No, that's not it at all. A wicked grin spread upon my face, my eyes narrowing into gleeful crescents. All the twisted fun I'd been missing out on became apparent. John was a hard-working businessman, a doting husband, and a loving father of two. He furrowed his brow in anxiety as he strode about the vacant parkade, his briefcase swaying as he rushed to his sedan. The corporate manager was incredibly demanding, forcing him to work ridiculously late. His wife would surely be frustrated by his absence, and his children would be quite upset that he missed their usual after-dinner playtime. John absent-mindedly entered his car and shoved the key in the ignition. Oh, how surprised John was when I leapt from the back seat and stabbed a needle into his arm, emptying the syringe into him. Oh, how he squirmed as the powerful sedatives put him to sleep. I tucked his body beneath the blankets under which I had been hiding all day and drove back to my house. Her voice murmured gleeful compliments as I coiled rope around John's unconscious body binding him securely to a metal chair. Oh, what a great job you've done, my dear James. She cooed as I stuffed a cloth into John's mouth, slapping duct tape on to seal his lips. John's eyelids fluttered briefly. He's awake. Can I slash open his guts now? I asked. No, you absolute dunce. We must wait until he regains complete consciousness. Plus, until the sedatives wear off, he won't feel the maximum amount of pain. 
My stomach churned in disgust. The idea of murdering someone previously seemed quite exhilarating, but now I felt quite uneasy about actually putting that absurd idea into practice. The extent of the voice's insanity became apparent to me. Before, I'd assumed that the voice was a byproduct of my insanity, though my conscience tugged at me to abandon the act of depravity I was about to commit. No, no, I, I can't do it. This is beyond fucked up. I just can't. I croaked hoarsely. Don't be a fucking pussy, James. You signed up for this when you decided to become a lunatic, she screamed at me. When John regained complete consciousness, he struggled unrelentingly to free himself from his binds. But the thick ropes were tied meticulously around him, rendering him hopelessly immobile. His eyes widened in true fear, and he made muffled screams through his duct-taped mouth as I went to work on him with an assortment of sharp instruments. I threw up frequently while torturing him. But each time I begged to stop inflicting pain upon the poor man, her cruel voice chided me and convinced me to push forward. At last, the final flicker of life left John's eyes, and his frantic heart stopped pulsing, his bloody, mangled corpse dangling limply from the chair. Following her instructions, I incinerated the body and buried the ashes deep within a forest several miles outside of the middle of nowhere. For days, guilt consumed me, and I relapsed into alcoholism. What I did was beyond disgusting. It was heinous and revolting. I've tried to commit suicide, but I've always been a coward, and inevitably I return to the bottle to drown my sorrows. So, now, here we are. Her voice echoes in my head, complimenting me, telling me to lighten up. She says that what I did was a beautiful work of art, my initiation to bloodlust. But she is wrong. I harbour no urge to kill another. I am disturbed by the vile, demonic excuse of a human being I have become. My descent into madness reaches an ear-splitting crescendo. My last whisper of sanity reeks of whiskey and stale breath. My heart slams against my ribcage as I heard a loud crash. Dust spills about the dimly lit room as an emaciated figure slowly descends the ladder from the attic. I emit panic screams as I stumble backwards trying to escape. Who the fuck are you? I scream. A toothy grin spreads across her pale face. Why, James, I'm the voice in your head. When Serena was five, her mother had left one cold and miserable day in late October to pick up some milk at the grocery store in town and never come back. That was nine years ago, and now Serena was fourteen and could barely remember her. The memory she'd managed to keep of her mother was of her sitting by the window day after day, staring out at the dense woods surrounding their house. She always had a worried look on her face, like she was scared of something hiding within them. The rest of what she knew about her mother came from photos of holidays and birthday parties, and the occasional disgruntled mumblings of her father. Serena's dad was almost as absent as her missing mother. It wasn't because he was a bad man. It was just that Serena had the misfortune of looking exactly like her mother. She had her mother's thick blonde hair, fair skin, and her almond-shaped blue eyes. She also had her high cheekbones, small chin and slender build. She looked nothing like her father, who was very broad and dark. Serena's father often used his work as an excuse to avoid her. He always went into work at the crack of dawn, 
and usually work late into the night, a night like tonight. At ten, the sound of the front door opening and heavy footsteps on the wooden floors downstairs announced his return home. The house phone began to ring. Dad, can you get that? She called out. She'd finally found a comfortable position under her covers, and she didn't want to get up. The sound of the footsteps stopped, but the ring of the phone did not. Annoyed, Serena threw off her cover and ran into the hallway. She grabbed the phone just before the person on the other side hung up. Hello? Serena said. She could hear her father begin to climb the stairs. He would want to know who was calling this late. Hi, her father answered back. Serena's mouth went dry. I'm just calling to say I won't be home tonight. I'm going to stay overnight at the office. You mean you aren't home right now? And you're not downstairs? Serena asked, her voice cracking in the middle. No. Why? The footsteps had reached the top of the stairs and someone was standing behind her. She felt their hot breath caress the back of her neck. Because I heard you come in, and now you're standing right behind me. Only, it's not you. A pause at the other end. I love you, Serena, her father said into the phone. I'm hanging up now and calling the police. Serena began to cry. Not because she was scared, but because her father had said he loved her. She hadn't heard those words in a long time. It was a bittersweet moment. I love you too, Dad, she said, right before two massive hands reached out and cut off her air. Dear diary, today is the day. Today I get to be bitten by a snake, just like Daddy. I've been waiting for this since the first time Daddy picked up a snake at church. He said that God had come and told him that he could pick up snakes, and he did. He picked up a big rattler and held out his arm, and it bit him. A lot of people screamed. I did too. But, except for a little blood, he didn't die. He read from the good book about picking up snakes, and drinking poison, and other things. It was really cool. Later, I heard him telling Mama that he finally figured out how he can save all of our people. <laughs> that is real smart. He knows a lot about God, and about snakes, too. Daddy's picked up his snake a lot in the past two years. I call him Sammy. Daddy keeps him in the garage and feeds him mice and stuff. Oof, it's icky. Jimmy says there are other churches that pick up snakes. But Dad is the only one that lets his snake bite him like that. God must like him a whole lot. <sighs> Jimmy pulled my hair again yesterday. He makes me so mad. But he also kind of makes me smile. Every time Daddy lets Sammy bite him, he says it's a miracle. He says that whenever a miracle happens, we get to see the face of Jesus, and that makes us blessed. I think he's right. Blessings have been happening to people in our church. Jimmy's folks got a shiny new car. Daddy clicked his tongue and said he didn't know if that was such a good idea. But I hope Mr. Jones will take me for a ride soon. I bet it goes fast. And Mama asked Daddy if we could go someplace fun next month. Since the Petersons just got tickets to Mexico, Daddy said now is not a good time. Maybe they could talk about it later, which means no. Daddy and some of the other men went out in the hills and got more snakes. Enough for each family. He says we should all be better at the same time. I'm excited to be special too. But... 
I don't know about something. When Daddy first got Sammy, he took him out into the garage. I don't think I was supposed to look, but I did. Daddy was messing with Sammy's mouth. I think he took something out of his teeth. He caught me looking and told me that he was doing God's work and healing Sammy, and that it was our little secret. But he didn't heal the new snakes. I guess they just weren't sick. I can't wait for this afternoon. We're going to have a big meeting and everyone's going to be there. I like Daddy's sermons more since he let Sammy bite him. He used to just talk about how bad things were. And how the world was going to hell. But now he talks about heaven. And how great it is there. Sammy really seems to make him happy. When Daddy put me to bed last night... I asked him if he thought we'd see Jesus' face today. He smiled and kissed me on my forehead and said, I know we will, honey. I really want to see Jesus, just like he does. I have to go. We're starting soon. I'll tell you all about it tonight when we get home. Love, Ruby. If you happen to find yourself alone at night on Oakwood Road, with no moonlight nor a friend at your side, pray that you don't hear the laughing coming from the dark behind you. It starts out as a small laugh, a schoolyard giggle. It's high and sweet, like that of a young child. You turn, startled by the sound. You thought you were alone on this isolated road. And why is a small child out so late at night? Especially on a road like Oakwood. Then you wonder why you're alone on a road like Oakwood so late at night yourself. Especially when you hear that laugh again. But this time it isn't so sweet. It's louder this time. It sounds like the laugh a twisted little kid would make after he pushed his mother down the stairs. How can a laugh sound like that? You don't know. Your head snaps around, and this time you see something standing in the middle of the road, about five yards back. It's small, about the size of a child. It looks like a kid dressed up for Halloween back in the early 1900s. You know, one of those homemade costumes. But it is nothing as innocent as that. The custom is nothing more than a brown sack with two holes cut out for eyes, and a blue onesie. The I just pushed my mummy down the stairs laugh is coming for it, but not for long. It soon begins to croak, like father came home, found mummy dead at the bottom of the stairs, and is wringing the wicked child's neck. Then, there's a snap. All goes silent, and its head falls to its side at an unnatural angle. And that's when you run. You get all the way home and crawl under your covers. You can't stop shaking. What was that? Did you dream it? Or did that really happen? That's when you hear a tap at the window. A cold sweat breaks out on your forehead, and your eyes slowly inch towards the glass square. You see a shape pressed against it, and you feel terror rise up in your gut. But it's only a tree branch. Ah. <sighs> You need to stop. This is silly. You didn't really see that thing back there. It was just your mind playing tricks on you in the dark. The sound of your front door opening causes you to sit up in bed. Did you lock the door behind you when you came in? <gasps> you came in in such a hurry that you don't think so. 
You hear footsteps climbing the stairs. It feels like an eternity before they reach the top. Then there's a sound of small feet running down the hallway. Your door flies open and then slams shut. If you hadn't been feeling terrified already, you are now. But instantly, your mind tries to rationalize it. Maybe one of your family members mistook your door for the bathroom door. Or even the door to their own bedroom. Although, you aren't sure why they would be coming in this late at night. From the darkness of your bedroom, you hear a small laugh. A schoolyard giggle. It's high and sweet, like that of a young child. It's coming from under your bed. You lie there, frozen, unable to move a muscle out of fear. Even as you hear it pull itself out from under your bed with its small fingernails. Even as it climbs into bed with you. Even as it wraps its cold little hands around your neck and begins to squeeze. It's been lost as to when exactly it happened, when they came. At first, it seemed like there were just a few of them. They weren't too much of a threat. Some of us would go missing from time to time, but it wasn't enough to really worry anyone. Every living thing has disappearances from other creatures or simply losing one's way. Eventually, they came like locusts, like a plague. They were everywhere. They were taking over our homes, tearing them apart to create their own crude structures. They brought with them unimaginably loud noises and screaming. Then along the way, one of us found out that they, those things, were... They were eating us. More and more of us began to disappear, and sometimes one of us would stumble across the body strung up, cut, gutted, lifeless, butchered beyond recognition. Those creatures would carve off pieces of flesh, add some kind of dirt to them, or an odd liquid, some sort of unusual seasoning perhaps, then put it in a pan or other cooking means. Oh, and the smell. Oh God, the smell. Have you ever smelled the flesh of your brother, father, sister, neighbor, someone you grew up with, someone you knew? The smell of them cook. It's horrid. We weren't the only ones, though. No. They snatched up just about any other species to feast on, to make meals of. Over time, we gave up and moved into the forests. Some of us lived on the edges, roaming close to the things and places that these creatures created. Some of us pushed deep into the woods in an attempt to hide and try to live a new life, away from the gnashing teeth of those things and the horror they brought with them. But in the forest, our chances of survival dwindled as well. We now had to be careful of other predators. Mountain lions, bears, wolves, coyotes, anything that ate meat. We didn't have the spaces to hide from these threats anymore. And those demons, those alien things that pushed us deeper, also pushed animals that would hunt us deeper into the forest as well. Although we still used the sun to see, we grew accustomed to the dark more, and we could easily move around. It was easiest to search out food in the between times, such as dusk and dawn. Those things weren't as active then. We learned what areas to avoid, when we could creep up to their buildings and homes to find some sort of forgotten treat long missed by our mouths. 
Sometimes a night of searching for something to put in our bellies and sustain us was met with disgusting horror. Finding bodies of fallen brethren on the sides of the roads, mangled, broken, twisted. If we were lucky, the bodies we came across weren't too badly mutilated. But sometimes... Well, sometimes they were worse. A body might be cut in half, looking as if something ripped it apart rather than cut it. Blood would be splattered around and intestines or other internal organs would be spilling out of whatever unnatural hole was nearest to them. The eyes would stare at nothing. Dark, lifeless, haunting. All you could do was cringe, hope that they didn't feel too much pain before they died and walk or run away from it all. Many times we tried to take solace in the fact that if one of us was found dead on the road, we knew at least it wouldn't be eaten by one of those lanky, groping, angry things. They treated us like nothing. We had become nothing. I'm sure we were just kept around, and our population not completely wiped out, so they could have some sport some entertainment. But they didn't even really care if we were hungry or tired, or just wanted a little food. Just wanted our family. Most of the time they would just break us and throw us aside, if we even crossed their path. By the time I came into this world, this was the type of life we had known for generations. Living on the edge of a world that was stolen from us doing what we could to survive, sometimes going hungry for months, and sometimes I was so hungry. This morning I woke up that way, well, I say morning, but it was actually just before dawn. I stretched and stood up, walking the sleep off with my cramped limbs. My stomach grumbled almost immediately. I hadn't eaten anything substantial in a few days. I'd kept to the forest, foraging for what I could find that nature provided. I knew there was a clearing not far, but it was dangerous to be out in the open for too long. The air was getting colder each day, and frost could be found on the grass in the mornings. It would be winter soon, and seemed like it was gearing up to be a rough one. My stomach groaned at me again, and I knew I had to risk it. With winter, food would become more scarce, so I needed as much as I could get right now. Maybe I wouldn't have to get too exposed. Maybe I could just go to the edge of the clearing and find something I could use to satiate my stomach for a bit. When I got there, I could look around and make sure that it was safe. Take my time to be sure there were no lurking predators. Then push into the clearing where I knew I could find some bushes with berries, at least. I made my way slowly to my destination, stopping at a stream along the way to drink some of the cold water. It felt icy, but good slipping down my throat. Before I knew it, I was in the trees at the edge of the open space. It didn't seem like there was anything around. I'd seen a few others through the trees on my way, but I didn't see anything that would harm me. Still, I waited a while, circling the little clearing and looking for anything good to eat as I did. Eventually, I'd walked twice around it, and there was still no sign of anything or anyone lurking around. I stepped hesitantly out of the tree line and thought I heard a noise. I jerked my head up and looked around for a second, then froze and strained my eyes to hear it again. Nothing. Just the normal sounds of the forest. Birds chirping. Wind rustling the leaves a bit. Small animals scurrying around. The night around me seemed to be getting just slightly lighter, and I looked towards the sky, knowing the sun was inching its way around to bring on the day to our corner of the world. I shook off the feeling that something was out there, since I'd heard nothing else. Just a few feet into the clearing, 
I could see a bush. It was a bush full of beautiful, delicious berries. My mouth watered just looking at them. Still moving slowly and carefully, stepping gingerly through the grass in very calculated motions, I approached the berry bush. By the time I reached it, I'd still heard nothing and felt at ease now, relishing the thought that I would get those juicy berries into my belly soon. I bent down to pull a berry from a small branch when I heard it. This time, it was unmistakable. Leaves being crunched slowly and methodically under feet. I looked up again, searching for where the sound was coming from, but couldn't quite tell. Then, I saw it. It was one of those things that liked to cut us up, to torture us, then dine on our seared flesh and body parts until it could no longer stuff any more into its stomach. It was coming from just ahead of me, stalking quietly, partially covered by the trees surrounding it on the opposite side of the clearing, eyes staring straight at me. I needed to move, and fast. My thoughts all ran and screamed in my head. My bones burned with the knowledge that they needed to run. My blood pumped with the adrenaline trying to make my limbs respond to what my brain knew they needed to do. I started breathing heavy and quick. I screamed in my head to tell myself to just run, get out of here. Finally, as the creature lifted its arms, pointed toward me, wanting me. I was almost to the edge of the clearing. My legs remembered how to work, and I spun around to run as rapidly as I could. Suddenly, an intense, burning pain shot up through my back, and I crumpled to the ground. I was too late. It had me. I tried getting up, but my left leg couldn't move, and then pain rippled through me. I heard it coming up to stand over me. The last thing I saw was that thing, pointing something at me. I could see the top of its body had a sort of bright skin, orange and blinding in the rising light. The last thing I heard was it say, Your antlers are gonna look mighty fine on my wall. Then, the human shot me again, ending the pain. The rain always made me miserable. There was nothing worse than getting mail from across a wide street. Dodging cars on a slippery road often upset me, yet I jogged to the rusty old mailbox, which screeched open with age. The thick envelopes of bills filled my hands. One particular small square package stood out, labelled, Save Their Lives Fund. Normally I would never bother with these packages, but I would still set them aside out of curiosity. I crossed the wet, car sped street and entered the house, throwing the mail on the table. Ugh. I realized again that I was late for work. After a long drive through the bad weather, I made it to my dead-end job, where my boss was waiting to nag my ear off about how close I was to being fired. Most of the employees knew that he needed me, so I considered his threats as empty words. Now, I work in the credit card fraud department, overlooking serious changes on accounts of people who have more money than I would make in 40 years. I won't lie. I have been tempted to use accounts to take some extra cash, but I've always chickened out. After a long shift, I headed home to rest my feet and watch Netflix. While turning on my PS4 and waiting for the menu to show up, I caught a glimpse of the plain charity package from the mail this morning. It wasn't much to look at, but I opened it and out slipped pictures of sad Nigerian children. 
followed by a cheap DVD which showed more Nigerian kids in tears. I placed the DVD into my PlayStation 4, which activated a special app to download from the disc. I accepted, and the app played. Like Skype, the app showed a real-time video of numerous Nigerian kids crying in a dirty, dimly lit room. They were malnourished and wore tattered clothing. Urine, fecal matter, and some blood stained the floor. Two old Nigerian men came into the room. One faced the camera as the other grabbed a screaming boy. The man facing the camera said, These children are in dire need of money. So, with your generous offer of 30,000 American dollars, you can save this boy's life. The other man gripped the boy's hand and cut off four of his little fingers. The child screamed in agonizing pain as the man lifted the boy's blood-spraying hand up to the screen. I didn't think this was real. Maybe it was a special effect. The man then said, So, Daniel Parson of 5677 Lake Drive, Austin, Texas. Will you do what it takes to save this boy's life? The app I had installed had hacked my PS4 profile, which showed my exact information and location. He gave me two days to donate the money. I was thinking about calling the police, but then the man broke my thought process by saying that if I went to the authorities, they would kill all of the kids. I witnessed the injured boy being taken away with his blood trailing behind still crying from the intense pain. So, I went to work the following morning and stole some account numbers. Twenty stolen accounts granted me the money I needed in two days. I turned on the PS4 and got into the app. The men asked if I had the money. I agreed while sending the amount. Ah, we humbly thank you for your generous donation, Daniel the man said as the other man let the boy go. I was relieved until he grabbed another screaming child, ready to do the same to that boy as he did with the other. The man looked directly into the screen and said, So, Dan, are you ready to save another life? Salt Creek Road is a seven-mile road in Brown County, Indiana. It and Sweetwater Trail connects Nashville, Indiana, to Sweetwater Lake. The road is a very narrow, two-lane road, with sharp turns and grated bridges. I was 22 at the time. I'd gone with my buddies to watch the Monday night football game at the golf course bar, just outside Nashville. Halfway during the third quarter, I told my friends I was done for the evening and was heading home. I wasn't terribly drunk, just a little tipsy at worst. I lived on Sweetwater Lake in my family's lake house that they'd owned for nearly 60 years. I'd only been on Salt Creek Road for a few minutes when I heard the approaching noise of a large truck. Hmm, that's odd, I thought to myself. There are many other ways a semi could get to the lake that were easier to travel. Deciding to let it pass me, I slowed down and pulled up. I saw the two yellow headlights coming closer, and then... nothing. The lights passed my car, but there was no source for the lights themselves. I could still hear the noises of the diesel engine growing fainter and fainter. Passing it off as some semi-drunken hallucination, I continued driving. And that's when I started to smell diesel fuel. And blood. Off in the distance, I could see an orangish, yellow light. I feared that the vehicle was on fire and reached for my cell phone, but I stopped in shock as I saw the entire scene in front of me. A large semi-truck had careened off the road into Salt Creek and the rocky cliffs on both sides. The engine had exploded, setting the contents of the truck on fire. The driver had been catapulted through the windshield and into a nearby tree, 
decapitating him. The body was still squirming, blood pouring out from his neck and everywhere else in his body. I pulled over and stepped outside, vomiting all over the pavement. I'd only dialed nine when the body stopped squirming. It stood up and seemed to be facing me. The stench of his putrid breath from this far away told me that I wasn't dreaming. I thought I was safe when I sped off in my car, but I looked in the mirror and realized it was still following me at superhuman speeds. And it wasn't even walking. Rather, it seemed to be floating a foot or so above the ground. I floored it, only wanting to get away from this demon. On the side of the road were two on-duty officers, hidden just beyond a curve in the road. They camped out there frequently, hoping to catch drunk drivers before they crashed and killed themselves. I must have been doing 60 when I passed them, because they wasted no time starting after me. I didn't bother stopping. I would rather have been in jail than be caught by whatever that thing was. I just reached 80 when I missed a turn in the road, plowing into the empty cornfield. I wasn't hurt, but the cops soon caught up to me. You crazy son, what were you thinking going so fast on a country road? They questioned me as they put handcuffs on me. Officer, there's something after me. I passed a truck accident about ten minutes ago. It was terrible. The driver had been decapitated, but it started running after me. It went faster than any human I've ever seen. I could barely outrun it at thirty. Lying to the authorities won't get you anywhere. Now, let's... But the officer stopped short as the piercing shriek of something inhuman rang out. We all turned around, and I got a closer look at the creature that had been following me. It was around six feet tall, with filthy clothes and a dagger in one hand. They raised their guns in return, but in a flash it advanced on us, decapitating one of the officers. The remaining officer unloaded his entire cartridge but the bullet seemingly bounced off the creature, melting into molten shreds on the pavement. Having run out of ammo, we took no chances. The creature seemed faster this time, and it was now screaming every few seconds. It was the sound of nails on a chalkboard as the creature's claws slashed the sides of the car. Part of the rear bumper fell off with a clunk and tripped the creature, which crashed into the pavement. For a moment, we thought we'd lost it. I couldn't see it behind us, but the officer gasped and swerved to avoid something. I turned around to see the creature in front of the car, his dagger outstretched, and an evil grin stretched across the decapitated officer's head. We didn't slow down in time, and the sound of the collision was gruesome. The head fell, and stuck to the windshield, now laughing malevolently in the voice of the officer. The innards of the head were now starting to ooze onto the windshield. He let me go without explanation. I never plan on driving that road again. Every few weeks, there's a new report of a decapitated person or fine or around here. At night, I can hear the malevolent laughing of that creature, and the scratching at the windows. My dog will bark and growl. It's been like this for five months now, and I'm the only one that still knows what's going on. The remaining officer mysteriously disappeared a month after the incident. I've tried sending emails, but they are immediately deleted from my send box. Or my computer shuts down while I'm typing. And I keep receiving mail that says the same thing every time. I'm closer than you think. I lived next to this one kid who always had bandages wrapped around his entire head, even covering his face. I remembered his name was Wilbur, a 12-year-old boy who never left his house. 
He sometimes looked out of his bedroom window on the top floor at all of the kids who would play outside, while Wilbur just sat and watched. I remembered his windows had metal bars on them, so there was no way he could climb out of his bedroom. We sometimes communicated with each other by writing on pieces of paper, since Wilbur couldn't hear me because his window was locked. Wilbur only did this when his parents weren't around, because they, well, they were weird. His mother and father were those kind of parents that were insanely crazy about science and chemistry, well, according to Wilbur. They would stay in their basement and work all day and night, except for those times when they gave Wilbur some food daily. Now, they weren't treating him like an animal, it's just... His parents were very busy. They told Wilbur that he shouldn't go outside or make contact with anyone until his face had gotten better. He told me that he'd accidentally slipped on one of his parents' chemicals and had fallen face first, ruining his appearance. And his parents feared that he would be made fun of by the other kids in the neighborhood. I remember one time, a couple of older kids were throwing rocks and pebbles at his window laughing and pointing at Wilbur as he looked down. He told me that they would do it a few times, but he'd gotten used to it. But to me, he was always a great guy, and still is today. I've never been inside his house, but he showed me some of the cool stuff he collected, like comic books. He had loads of them, from Marvel to DC to other non-superhero comics. He was a huge superhero fan. He even said that he felt like a superhero. A normal human being who became affected by dangerous chemicals and then became a powerful superhero. He once wrote on the paper and then put it up to his window as he pretended to be a superhero. I had a collection of action figures and video games that amazed Wilbur. He told me that he'd never played a single video game in his life which was quite sad. He also told me that his babysitter had taken them away before he could play with them and burnt them in front of his eyes. Wilbur had a mean babysitter named Miss Fitzgerald, a tall, nasty lady who never liked kids at all. This had started before his face had even become messed up, he told me. She was basically every kid's nightmare. At least according to all the things he told me she's done. Miss Fitzgerald had babysat many kids before, and trust me, it was not pretty. Wilbur told me that the last kid she babysat, a four-year-old girl, she made her live through seven hours of hell. Wilbur said that Miss Fitzgerald had starved her, and surrounded her bed with a few bear traps, and the worst thing that had happened, well parents didn't know about her deed. She would lie to them just to get paid. From all the things I've heard, she is a foul, cruel woman with no soul at all. And now, she had to babysit this poor guy. Wilbur was old enough to make his own decisions, except for some, but his parents apparently hired this evil witch anyway. The parents had to go to Texas to a science convention, so Wilbur was left alone with her. One time, I was writing about her to show to him, but then I saw Miss Fitzgerald forcefully pulling him away from the window. One time, I was writing about her to show to him, but then I saw Miss Fitzgerald forcefully pulling him away from the window. And that was that. The rest of my day went by without talking to him. The next day, when I looked through my window to see Wilbur, I saw someone lying down on his bed. Looking at the person's wrapped head, I banged my fist on the window trying to get Wilbur's attention. He slowly sat up on his bed, wiping tears from his eyes. He seemed to be crying, which gave me a thought. I had a worried look on my face as I saw bruises all over his arms and legs. A faded dark tone of purple. 
He went to write something down on a piece of paper. Then, as Wilbur finished writing, he came up to the window and pressed a note on the glass. What he had written terrified me. The whole situation still burning in the back of my mind. Something I knew I could never forget. He had written, Help me! What made it worse was that his handwriting was scribbled onto the paper and was almost illegible. Wilbur kept banging on the window with his other hand. And then, suddenly, I saw someone else run into his bedroom next to him. Yes, it was her. You know who. She was holding something in both of her big, chubby hands. In one hand was a lemon, and in the other was a pair of scissors. What Miss Fitzgerald did next terrified me even more. She ran up to Wilbur, grabbing his head, holding it still. I saw him screaming in pain and fear, so I knew I had to do something. At the same time, I couldn't stop watching. She used her scissors to cut open the bandages and unwrap them off of his head, and threw them to the side. What I saw almost made me vomit. Something so sickening. I was utterly shocked at looking at Wilbur's real, deformed face. His whole head was completely covered by bandages, and what was underneath, I suddenly knew the purpose of those bandages. I saw his face, almost melted off, showing a dark red layer underneath. I could only describe his face as looking like melted cheese on a cheeseburger. It was Wilbur's whole face. Even one of his eyeballs was burnt a bit. Yeah, the chemicals had messed him up badly. Miss Fitzgerald sliced the lemon in half with her scissors pinning Wilbur down on his bed. Then she threw the scissors to the side, next to the bandages, and held his head still with one hand. With the other hand, she squeezed a lemon slice onto Wilbur's head, into his eyes, into the red layer of his face. Oh, the painful expression on his face, his loud, muffled screams, his face stinging from the acid of the lemon juice. She used the other part of the lemon to squeeze onto his face again, torturing Wilbur with extreme pain. I decided to bang my fist on the window, which was a bad idea. Miss Fitzgerald just looked over to the bedroom window, right at me. I jumped back, because she had noticed me. She ran back out of the bedroom, shoving Wilbur down as he screamed in pain and agony. I knew what she was going to do, so I ran out of my bedroom and ran downstairs. The good thing about this situation was that my parents don't know about Wilbur, coupled with the fact that they were at work for a little while. I locked the front door, hoping that Miss Fitzgerald wouldn't burst into my house. I looked around for the phone, but while I was doing this, a loud bang rang in my ear. I looked behind at the door, noticing her red, sweaty face and her curly blonde hair looking in. And by the looks in her eyes, I knew there was going to be some trouble. She kept banging on the door, nearly screaming her head off. As I looked around for the phone, I finally found it, next to the couch on the coffee table. I ran towards it dialing 911, as the sounds of her threatening screams could be heard from outside. After waiting for a few rings, I finally heard the operator's voice, the usual greeting from a 911 operator. I started explaining the whole situation from beginning to end, as quickly and as clearly as possible. They told me to wait patiently, as the police would arrive at my house soon. It took a few minutes for the police to arrive, and... When they did, my parents also arrived earlier from work as well. 
Apparently, they had got a call from the police, explaining my situation, and decided to immediately come home. Oh, my parents were extremely worried and frightened. They asked me more questions than the police did. I had to explain everything. From being friends with Wilbur, to how his parents had left him with an abusive babysitter, to what she had done. About an hour later, a police officer came to me. He had something he wanted to tell me about the horrible atrocities that had taken place next door. The truth about the babysitter, the parents, and Wilbur was truly shocking. Based on the evidence they'd found, Wilbur's parents weren't his actual parents at all. They'd adopted him from an orphanage that's out of town, just so they could perform an experiment on him. It was the reason why they'd moved to Texas, to hide. The babysitter, Miss Fitzgerald, was part of the experiment too. In fact, Wilbur wasn't the first kid to get adopted by these scientists. They had done illegal experiments on these orphans. It was to find out how much pain a child could take before death, based on the cause of death and the age of the child. 38 children between the ages of 2 and 13 had been reported missing, and Wilbur was one of them. There were security cameras on the outside and inside of the house. Then, they arrested Miss Fitzgerald for child cruelty and the deaths of so many children. And are now in the process of finding the two scientists. So, I was friends with someone who would have been killed if I hadn't called the police. Apparently, Wilbur also tried to lie about almost everything he told me. He was just trying to protect himself. He was sent to a new trusted family, a married couple who lived out of town. After that, I never saw him again. Well, until now. Twenty years after that incident, I went to a bar to get myself a few drinks, when a man approached me. Remember me, he said. I smiled realizing how long it had been since I last saw Wilma. In fact, he now looks like a nice, healthy man, without his bandages. He's brown-haired, with sky-blue eyes. And, to be honest, he almost looked like a complete stranger. After that, we talked and drank a few glasses of beer, finally speaking to each other in person. Wilbur and I knew that nobody would try to keep us apart that the scientists and the babysitter are probably still locked away right now. And I keep thinking about that again and again. The fact that this man would have been killed if I hadn't saved his life. He opened his eyes and looked about the room. Light from the door, the only illumination. He let his eyes wander over the items in the room, strange things that he did not know the use of. Above his head, he saw a screen with strange writing scrolling across it. He had no idea how long he had been there, nor did he know where he even was. All he knew was that he'd been taken there a long, long time before, that he was lying in a bed of sorts and that he was thirsty. So very thirsty. His mouth was dry and his tongue feeling sticky and swollen. His lips dry and in danger of cracking. Feeling a need to move, he felt resistance in his wrists. His arms were bound to the bed. His heart rate accelerating a bit as fear washed over him and he began struggling against the restraint. Sounds and movement in the doorway distracted him momentarily, his fear growing as the sounds came closer. Closing his eyes against the pain as a sudden bright light pierced his eyes. Opening them again, he recoiled in fear from the sight before him. Two creatures had come into the room and were approaching him. 
Even if forced, he could not begin to describe the horror that was these two creatures. They flanked him and looked down on him. One seemed to be the leader, as it was trying to communicate. Some incomprehensible gibberish spewing from what could have been called a mouth only in the most generous sense of the word. The creatures then pulled the covers from him, leaving him only covered in a very thin cloth. He began struggling again, whimpering in fear. What were they going to do to him now? The creatures moved him around, turning him this way and that. They released the things holding his arms, tied down, and he began fighting against them. The lead creature was apparently upset and was chastising him. The voice sharp. He soon gave up trying to fight his captors, not because he feared angering them, but because of the fatigue that overcame him. He lay there, shocked and defeated, stunned at the weakness in his body. He was sure that he had once been a strong man. The creature stripped him and began rubbing a strange wet substance over his body. Finally, they finished manipulating him, leaving him in a different position than before, again covered in the cloth and a fabric covering. One creature moved away and returned with a package. It spoke again to him, and then pushed something into his mouth. The texture, slightly rough, but moist. At first, relief washed over him as his parched mouth was wet, but then a stinging sensation and a strange taste hit him. He turned his head away as he sunk even deeper into despair. He closed his eyes, trying to shut out the world that was now his hell, and heard the creatures leaving the room, chattering to each other. Outside the room. Thanks, Cap. Let me know when you need help with your baths, Jan said, looking at her friend and co-worker. Glancing back, Looking sadly into the room they'd just left, Cam nodded and stopped. What's wrong, Jan? Jan shook her head. I don't know. Did you see his eyes? The way he looked at us? She looks back at the patient. He looked terrified. Cam nods again, also looking into the room. Yeah, I thought so too. He has dementia, yeah? Yes, he does. I wonder. Jan pauses, thinking. I mean, I know they lose their memory and all, but I just wonder. What if they lose the ability to recognize human faces too? Cam looks at Jan, horrified. Oh my god. What if they do? Jan picks up the thought. What does he think we are? What does he think we're doing to him? Both nurses shudder at the thought, looking sadly at the patient. Jen wonders out loud. What are we doing to him? I feel like I should post this all now, as this may be my only chance to tell any one of my experiences here. I'm covered in blood, and I'm sure the cops are going to come as soon as the next shift shows up. First off, my name's John Miller, and I began working at Whispering Grove University as a night security guard about six months ago, after an interesting stint of government work, details of which I probably shouldn't disclose here. It was an easy job, and it paid enough to live on. I figured I could use some normalcy, though. Well, normalcy is what I got up until recently. I was supposed to patrol the campus and verify that all of the doors were locked. The rest of the time I could just mess around and more or less do whatever I wanted, as long as every so often I walked around the campus. Like I said, easy. Being a school, however, I wasn't allowed to carry any weapons. Of course, I felt naked without my knife. So, everything was fine and dandy until about a week ago. That's when I started to hear footsteps coming from upstairs when I checked the lower rooms. There were only two floors, and up until then, I thought everything was brick or cement. 
footsteps sounded like a child running on hollow wood. Being the sceptic that I am, I decided to go check. I figured some kids had sneaked in, and I must have missed a door and left it unlocked, even though I always, always check the upper floor first. Oh, how wrong I was. Judging by the direction of the sound, it must have come from room 1283. It was locked. Oh, I'm nothing if not thorough, so I unlocked it with some difficulty and went inside. Usually the master key opens just about everything on campus. Not this door. It ended up being a small key I'd never used, about halfway through my key ring of like 30 or 40 keys. The door stuck, and I yanked it open as though it hadn't been used in years. I later found out that was because it hadn't. So I got it open and went inside. For a fairly well-kept school... It looked like something from an abandoned elementary school. I persisted, though. And when I went in further and climbed the three small steps, I found old computers and video equipment pointed at the wall. VHS tapes. I had nothing to watch them on, so I locked the room and continued the night as if nothing had happened, pushing through the sinking feeling in my gut. Now, side note. I realized that I forgot to explain the shift we work here, so here's the breakdown. Three guards work 7am to 3pm, three work 3pm to 11pm, and I work 11pm to 7am. We have a skeleton crew, so I usually work by myself. Sometimes I have to give up days off, but the overtime pay is nice, and it keeps the lights on at home. Not that anyone's there to use them. Well, back to the story at hand. So I went out the next day before work to a local pawn shop and found a VCR. I brought it with me that night to work and plugged it into the small TV in the security office. I was going to figure out what room 1283 was, but first, a cigarette. Apparently, it wasn't just room 1283 that wasn't normal about the campus, as when I went out for a cigarette, I ended up having a plight but terrifying conversation with a very proper-sounding talking boar, making his way through the campus to the grove out back that the school was named for. We more or less just exchanged pleasantries once I'd come to terms with the fact that it would be rude not to return his greeting. It takes a lot to rattle me. I guess I just had to adjust. I needed the job, and he didn't seem to be malevolent. His name was Ralph. I'm aware I probably sound crazy, but one of the afternoon guards, an older man named Jerry, confirmed that the grove out back attracted all sorts of oddities at night, and so the old buildings and the electrical grid were arranged in such a way to amplify that. So, I went back to 1283, after breezing through my rounds for the night. I was on a mission. I got into the room once again, pushed through the chill in the air and the knots in my stomach, grabbed the VHS tapes in a small trash can from the room, locked the door and headed back to the office. Most were ruined from age, but one was not. On this tape I saw unspeakable acts, brutal, violent acts committed in the adjacent room and recorded through a hole into 1283. It began with a man dressed as a Catholic priest, standing in the middle of a tiled room with a drain in the floor. There were shackles hanging from the ceiling that looked like something from at least a century ago. A young man was dragged into the room by another man in a hooded robe. The kid looked emaciated, like he hadn't eaten in days, and was dirty. The hooded man locked his hands into the shackles and left. The priest took a wicked-looking knife from somewhere in his robes, and the rest of the tape was the priests removing the boy's skin while laughing. The boy's screams were going to stick with me for a while. He finally, unceremoniously, slit the boy's throat so deep that his head almost came completely off. Oh, I puked. I had to find out what this was. An elaborate prank to scare me, or something darker. 
If it was a joke, it was the most realistic looking act I'd ever seen. I spent the majority of the next few days at the public library, reading book after book and scouring website after website. It turns out that Whispering Grove used to be a facility for the care of gifted children. What I'd seen was not care, and there was a special hate in my heart for someone who could do things like this to a child. The staff, now mostly dead, were funded by the church and apparently paid extra to assist and keep silent when the priest made his visits. Those bastards. They'd apparently remodeled when they were about to shut down, as well as reflooring and boarding and painting over the studio windows. No wonder it wasn't obvious. I brought some food for Ralph and his family. I met him outside at our usual meet-up time and plied him with the food in exchange for information. The priest's name was Gabriel. He didn't know the last name. Damn it. Well, I gave him some apples, as promised. My past work taught me anything. It was that networking was important. That night, I went back to 1283 after hearing more scampering footsteps. The boy on the tape hadn't been the only one, and I had to figure out how to help these children. When I walked in, the room was colder than normal. I could see my breath inside. It was July and 85 degrees outside. I googled how to contact spirits, but most of it was bullshit make-believe. I was going to have to wing it. Something I did worked, though all I did was walk in and loudly proclaim, I'm here to help. I immediately felt a breeze and a ceiling panel rattled. The lights flickered and dimmed. I had a flashlight, but this is exactly what I'd asked for. I wasn't the enemy. Much to my horror. A skinless boy with his head flopping around crawled out of the now discarded ceiling panel. He didn't move quite right, but I suppose that was to be expected. He scurried down the wall and onto the floor, coming to meet me at eye level. I'm not a small man, so this teenager had clearly already gone through his growth spurt. He gurgled while trying to speak. He clearly hadn't used his voice in a while. While he tried clearing his throat more, he pointed to a chair, then up to the panel he'd come from. He wanted me to go up there. Oh, fuck no. But it seemed that I had to. So I moved the chair over, climbed onto it, and stuck my head into the ceiling while turning on my flashlight. I almost shit my pants as the light came on, I was face to face with a semi-transparent girl, no more than six years old. She was smiling at me. When she moved out of my way, I guess she knew what I was doing. I saw the rope burns on her neck. I hated this priest more and more with each passing minute. I swallowed my anger and looked past the girl into what seemed like an old boarded up air vent. There were so many bones. Clearly this was the dumping ground for the remnants. So many kids had suffered here and were clearly trapped. When I came back down, the boy had found his voice, raspy as it still was. It was a bit unnerving to see a mostly severed head speak. Later, he said in a voice that sounded like sandpaper. He pushed through with short sentences, punctuated by long pauses. For now, St. Peter's Church. Then, Bones, we know who you are. The words clearly came at great difficulty, but I knew what he wanted. This sick asshole was still alive. I was supposed to fix that. Maybe I'm crazy. Because I was going to do it. Apparently the time had gotten away from me. Because, for whatever reason, Jerry had decided to come in early today. Not only that, he decided to look around for me. 
He got more than he'd intended when he came up the stairs, though. For I thought the spirit of the boy was unnerving before. I was certainly scared shitless when the ghost boy heard Jerry calling out my name, presumably after seeing the light on in the room. The boy's face twisted into a horrible mask of rage as he launched himself out the door and onto Jerry. The lights went out, and it was darker than it should have been. Jerry screamed that sickening, gut-wrenching scream of imminent death. By the time I'd gotten out of the room, Jerry was at the bottom of the stairs. He wasn't moving, and the spirits were gone. I closed the room and called the cops. Apparently, a 76-year-old man having a heart attack was sufficient enough for their medical examiner's research. I told them I'd heard him yell for me, and by the time I'd come out, I'd seen him at the bottom of the stairs. Well, not too far from the truth, but not too close either. And that was yesterday. I found St. Peter's Church this morning. I hadn't slept, so it wasn't difficult to play the flustered co-worker that needed a priest for a cleansing of demonic energies. What a crock of shit. But I expressed an affinity for Father Gabriel, and was assured that he would arrive during my shift. Hmm. Awful late for an old man. Awful early for an old monster. Dues had to be paid in full, and I was going to collect. I'd been offered the day off, but declined as well, I needed the money, which wasn't a complete lie. I went out for my smoke at the start of my shift, and spotted Ralph. He told me to go to the groves before the night's events. How would he know? Hmm, smart pig. I did as he said. The grove was aptly named, as when I entered, I heard constant unintelligible whispering. It was after a moment the glint of something shiny caught my eye from across the clearing. I made my way over to it and picked up a knife so long and sharp it could have been classified as a sword. Not knowing what else to do, I thanked the trees, hid the knife in my backpack, and made my way to the front of the building just as Father Gabriel arrived, emerging from the car, before telling them to come back in the morning. He figured this was going to take all night. Little did he know, it would take the rest of his life. I had to mask my intentions. I shifted my expression to that of timid concern and fear. I am here now, my child, the old man said with an airy tone of superiority. I threw up in my mouth a little at the attempted relation. I walked him through the rest of the school first so as not to alert him of my intentions. Pointless conversations about nothing the entire time as he made a show of pretending to cleanse the campus and banish evil spirits. The worst evil there was him, but not for long. If he was worried as we approached 1283, then he hid it professionally. It was getting harder to hide my intentions and disgust, and I could feel the temperature dropping. He must have felt it too. Maybe he was complacent and oblivious. As he rounded the corner, I wound back and hit him in the head as hard as I'd ever hit anything before. I put my whole body into it, and he crumpled. He woke at about 3 a.m. I couldn't use the room he'd used, as it was carpeted now, so I used a staff shower. He woke up and started freaking out when he realized he was tied to the shower head. I pulled out the knife, and he started screaming. I couldn't help but laugh as I cut his skin off, his screams only fueling my laughter and drive to continue. This was my errand mort, my honor killing. I was the vengeance the children needed, and he felt that fact. He died within the hour. It took me about another hour to bag up all the bones, videotapes, and the priest's robes. I took them out behind the grove to burn them. When I got back to the office to await my fate with the cops, as I had no way to dispose of a body, I picked up his wallet. An old, yellow picture fell out. 
There was a picture of him, and the boy, and the hooded man. But the hooded man was uncloaked, and he looked an awful like a younger version of Jerry. Hello? Hello? Anyone still there? You're all asleep, aren't you? I can basically say anything I want right now, and none of you will be me awake to listen to this part of it. <laughs> I'm sure some of you are. Um, great collection of short stories there, all from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up, so that you lovely people could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. Did you like that? Did you like these longer format ones with the uh, rain sounds in the background? A lot of people seem to like them. You know, I've been doing this on and off for years now, but first time I've kind of formally said, yeah, okay, this is designed especially to let you all drift off to sleep. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, do share them with me in the comment section below the vid. Eh, that way I'll know that some of you are still listening this far in. <laughs> well, I'll be back again very soon. Till next time, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.